Uh, I know many, but not all of you here. I'm Sheila Wildman. I'm Associate Director of the Health Law Institute, and it's my honor to introduce today's uh, speaker in our Health Law and Policy Seminar series, Professor Rivka Carney. Uh, Professor Carney is President of Ben Gurion University uh, of the Negev in Israel, uh, a position that she's held since 2006. Prior to taking up that post, she was Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences at Ben Gurion and Director of the Genetics Institute at the Soroka University Medical Center. Um, I add that Professor Carmi is the first woman to have been Dean of a medical school in Israel and the first woman to have been a university president in that country. Uh, last year, she was chair of the, uh, the country's committee of university heads. Apart from her impressive career in university administration, Professor Carmi has made significant scientific contributions in the area of medical genetics. A graduate of the Hadassah Medical School of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, she uh, completed a residency in pediatrics, a fellowship in neonatology, and then a further fellowship in medical genetics at Boston Children's Hospital uh, and Harvard University Medical School. Professor Carmi is the incumbent of the Kreitner Foundation Chair in Pediatric Genetics at Ben Gurion. She's authored over 120 publications in medical genetics and along with her team has identified numerous new genes and mutations, including one which has been named Carney syndrome. Uh, her research has uh, focused mainly on the clinical manifestations and molecular basis of genetic diseases in the Arab Bedouin population of the Negev. Professor Carney's many accomplishments will be more formally recognized on Friday when this university will be awarding her an honorary degree. We're lucky that she could take the time uh, to speak with us about the ethical and social dimensions of her work. The rough plan is for Professor Carney uh, to speak until roughly one o'clock, but possibly uh, later than that, followed by questions if we have time. Uh, we're gonna have to wrap up by 1.20 to make way for an incoming class. So with that, over to you, Professor Carney. Well, thank you very much, Sheila, for this kind introduction and uh, Good day. Uh, it is, uh, it's not afternoon yet, right? So everybody, you're quite dispersed here. So uh, if you feel comfortable like that, I need to go. And if uh, any, uh, every now and then, I will fix on one group, bear with me. <laughs> so uh, it is really wonderful to be here. I just arrived at uh, 1 o'clock, 1 a.m. in the morning. So if I have any kind of uh, language uh, barriers, lapses, whatever, I'm expecting your help. Um, this is my first time, as I say, to Halifax, uh, and I'm very thrilled to be here. And uh, thank you for taking the time to come and hear um, my story about my research with the Bedouin community in Israel. Uh, obviously, as a university president, I don't get to do too much of that. Lately, my last uh, PhD student graduated about three uh, years ago uh, when he um, uh, fortunately managed to find the gene for the syndrome that I first clinically delineated some 20 or 20 uh, more years ago. So for years we had the, uh, the syndrome, we knew uh, all the pathophysiology of this Carmi syndrome, and only three years ago we have identified the mutation that uh, that is causing this uh, uh, very unfortunate, devastating disease. Uh, just to show you that uh, with all uh, due respect to uh, the wonderful technologies that we, ha we are encountering these, day these days in genetics, in medicine in general and genetics in particular, it might take some years and times uh, before you actually get to uh, the results that uh, you are looking for mainly understand what is the molecular basis of those genetic diseases. So I came to, to the Negev, which is the southern part of Israel, as you can see here. This is the Negev region of Israel, the southern part of Israel, which is about two-thirds of Israel and Mets, only less than 10% of the, city, of the uh, population. Uh, it's sparsely populated. It has uh, a, a community of about 200,000 Bedouin, Muslim, Arabs, uh, residing in the Negev. We'll get there in, in a moment. 
באר שבע is the capital of, uh, of the Negev, a Ben Gurion University is located here, the main campus is in uh, Be'er Sheva. Uh, this is, uh, I would say, a very regular picture for the Negev at this time of the year. When it's about to rain, it almost doesn't rain there. It is an arid zone or, or a dry land, but when it does rain, we have a lot of floods going on all over the place. Uh, Belgium University is, in a way, kind of an oasis down there. Uh, it is located, as I said, in Be'er Sheva, uh, and uh, it, was, um, it was created about 44 years ago with a governmental mandate to spearhead the development of the Negev. So the idea was to bring an institution of higher education to this part of the, uh, of the country in order to attract scientists, in order to attract scholars, and by that, to develop all kinds of um, uh, academic research projects that will cater, will take care uh, of the needs of a dry land to be uh, sustainable in order for people to live there. So in that regard, the university has, has done a lot. Obviously, I do not have the time to dwell on all the, uh, the, fields, of, and the fields that the university is involved in, uh, in developing the, the, uh, the region in general. Um, and I will, um, uh, I will dwell and emphasize on my own research within the medical school. My research there, I came to the Negev right after I graduated from medical school in Jerusalem. And I came with a very ideological uh, drive uh, to actually help promoting the health system, especially the uh, the, um, uh, the community clinics in the Negev, uh, and I was also interested in genetics. I was interested in genetics since I was 14 years old, and I pursued this interest uh, very vigorously throughout medical school and later on. Uh, and I realized uh, very, very quickly that one of the major health issues of the Negev uh, was genetic disease, birth defects among Bedouins. You know, in all other places you find all other kinds of uh, uh, um, uh, health challenges. Either infectious disease or prematurity, but in that traditional community the major health problem was uh, birth defects and genetic disease. Now, what is the characterization of, characterization of the Bedouin community that, by the way, uh, dwells in the Negev, but uh, also exists in Jordan? Uh, in fact, a large degree of similarity between the Negev Bedouins and the Jordanian Bedouins uh, emerged from the fact that they have common founders uh, that actually came hundreds of years ago from the Arab Peninsula. Some of them came to the Negev, some of them to Jordan. And it is a highly traditional, religious, but not that religious, becoming more extremist or more extremely religious in recent years. But throughout the years, it was more traditional rather than uh, religious. So as I said, about 200,000, uh, about 10% of the Arab population in Israel in general uh, this is a tribal community with almost 80 different tribes. And they have three very distinctive, distinct uh, social groups. One is the landowners, the ones that came, the, the very old, um, um, uh, the, the, the first to come to the Negev hundreds and hundreds of years ago, the peasants, the one that came later on mostly from uh, Egypt, and the ex-slaves, the, uh, the uh, black Bedouins that came from Sudan, were brought by sheikhs, uh, landowners, uh, as their slaves, and eventually later on uh, uh, developed their own community. And those three social groups are totally separated. I mean, they cannot marry within each other. In fact, 
They cannot even marry between uh, tribes of the same social group. Needless to say, between among groups. There are few founders in the sense that when they originally came, there weren't many, many people coming in. There were a couple of uh, hundreds of founders that came there, and in a minute you will understand why it is important in terms of, uh, of genetics or in terms of medicine. Something which is very highly characteristic of the community is high rate of consanguinity. And the definition for consanguinity is marrying within the family. In, in, the, in the Bedouin community, as you will see in a moment, about 60% of all marriages are among first cousins. There are more 10 or 15% marrying within the family in a bit, uh, in, a, in, a, in a less or a more um, uh, far away, but still within the family, second cousins, third cousins, but first cousins, and sometimes double cousins, meaning sharing grandparents on both sides is something which is not uncommon in the Bedouin community. And by the way, this is the highest rate in all the Mediterranean, in all the, uh, the uh, far, uh, in, in, the, in the Mediterranean area. Uh, there are a lot of consanguinity in other um, uh, uh, communities in the Middle East as well, but within the Bedouin community, it is the highest. Now, there is another custom in the Bedouin community, which is po polygamous uh, marriage. Polygamy is not legal in Israel, but it is very often practiced in the Bedouin community. We don't have exact numbers, but the, uh, the general impression is about fourth of the marriage in general are polygamous, having more than one wife, sometimes more than, a, than three wives. It means that the families are big. It means that uh, there are many children there. And again, it has, uh, it has a very uh, important effect on birth defects and, uh, and genetic diseases. As I said, it is unlegal in Israel, but still, you know, uh, the authorities in Israel just make, put a blind eye towards their um, uh, trying not to extremely involved in their own um, uh, traditional uh, way of life. And lastly, there is a very high birth rate among the Bedouins. You know, there are about 20% of the whole population in the Negev and more than 50% in the annual births in that Soroka Medical Center that was just mentioned before, um, uh, uh, which is the only hospital in the Negev, more than 50% of the births. And it is not unusual to see in an average Bedouin family about six, you know, they, they say in terms of, of uh, 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 6.7, not, not that we have a seventh of a child, but on the average, 6.7 uh, children per couple. Just imagine, imagine in a polygamous uh, marriage, you can get as high as 20 kids per family in one household. As I told you before, this is one of the early um, studies that we, uh, we did with close to 1,000 people. Here, we, it's only part of, the, of, those, of that study where we found that the vast majority of the Bedouin population is actually married within the family. Uh, these are some scenery pictures of uh, what uh, you can see in that uh, uh, community, which was nomadic, or at least semi-nomadic, for uh, many, many years and up until about 50 years ago. About 50 years ago, uh, it was mainly around the, uh, the nation build in this uh, uh, neighborhood, Israel, was, um, uh, was declared in 1948, uh, Jordan in 47, mm -hmm. Lebanon. Uh, at that point, they were more and more uh, pushed to live in, in defined areas. But still, even in, in more uh, uh, official settlements, you can see a very modern house, and but nowadays there are more and more of them but right next to it, you see the sheds, you see the tents, 
and the husbandry, you know, camels and, and, uh, and all kinds of other animals that they grow. So some of them are of a very low paid, you know, kind of blue color, uh, either um, um, professional or not professional, um, um, blue color workers, uh, but, but unemployment is very, very high in this community, can get as high as 24, 20, or 30%. Uh, some more uh, authentic pictures still, about 50% of the Bedouins live in, uh, in formal neighborhoods that, they, that the government has built for them, uh, but almost 50% are still scattered in the Negev, in shanty towns, in encampments, in tents, and this is what you can find very often. You know, uh, uh, I don't know whether you can see a baby lying over here, uh, right there and then by the tent in the desert. So the ill effect of consanguinity is actually bringing about genetic diseases, the kind of that we call recessive diseases. Are there any medical uh, people around here in this, in this room? Okay. So I have to be a little bit more specific. Uh, in this kind of, uh, of diseases, recession diseases, each of the parents has to carry a mutation, which by itself, because we have two versions of the same gene, by itself having one recessive mutation uh, does not, should not cause any detrimental effect. So you can live uh, normally and you don't even know in many cases that you carry a recessive disease and it is estimated that about uh, each and every one of us carry, carries about six or seven mutations in various genes. However, they are in a single state so we don't even know about them. But once they are in a double situation, then the disease uh, uh, is, is, is occurring and is being the, and the phenotype of the disease is being evident. So when you have the same grandparents, and if you are a product of consanguinity, your chances of having a recessive disease if your parents are first cousin is 25%. And here you, say, you see a model of what's happening here. So there is a grandfather here that carry a mutation in itself, uh, normal, no problem, Mostly the first generation that, uh, that brings the mutations do not marry within the family. Then this union has two um, uh, offspring, okay? Again, they marry out of the family, but they do transmit that recessive <coughs> uh, gene. Once there is a cousin marriage, and the two lines mean, uh, you know, this, this kind of union, there is 25% of transferring both mutations to a child. 25% to have a genetic disease, which is quite high. So this is not unusual. This is what you see in the Bedouin community, and we've seen a lot of, of, of such uh, family pedigree because much of our research was basically uh, relying on eliciting this kind of information, genetic information, genealogy, for many, many tribes in uh, the Bedouin community. And you can see here all the ingredients. You, oh, I'm sorry. You can see here a um, uh, case of a polygamy, by the way. You see this is one man married to one, two, three uh, women. And consanguinity, first degree, uh, first cousins married, and those are the affected children. I'm sorry you don't see this line because here you have even many more affected kids because, you know, again, there are uh, cousins or double first cousins uh, and this is not the most complicated family tree that uh, we have encountered. Um, okay. So in the early 1990s, when the Human Genome Project started, we have embarked on a systematic identification of genes in the Bedouin community. And the idea was actually uh, 
uh, uh, coming from, I would say, two different considerations. One of them, as it always the case in uh, research, um, a matter of interest. We are very much interested in really elucidating the molecular basis. What is going wrong with the DNA so to bring those very, some of them, very severe, devastating genetic diseases in the Bedouin community. And the idea was that the more information we get from those diseases, the more information we can provide the world with. And as the Human, uh, human Genome Project evolved, in fact, we have supplied the world literature with a lot of insights about very unusual genetic diseases, however, that had very much to do with other common diseases. So if you have a genetic disease that affects the kidneys, you can definitely look at it as maybe uh, uh, a way to look at more common kidney diseases, that some of them are being brought by some kind of a genetic change. So when we decided up upon the first project, we have, um, we have chosen one disease that was highly prevalent in three different huge, big uh, tribes in, uh, in, in the Negev. I'm going to tell you the name, but obviously you won't say anything to you, uh, the Bader Beal syndrome. Three different tribes with many affected people with obesity, with uh, progressing blindness, vitreous pigmentosum, with diabetes, uh, with some kind of genetic, of, of inborn, of congenital defect, having extra fingers, and other features which could be seen in other more common diseases. Obesity is very common. Most of the obesities are not genetically, most of, uh, of diabetes are not genetically determined. But the idea was that once we get to the gene, that causes those diseases in a recessive state, maybe those genes will be playing a role in common diseases as well. So that was the idea, first of all, to go systematically, look at the genes, find the molecular basis, having more ideas and information about those very unusual diseases. But then in the first place, or the second place, provide the community with means to lower the prevalence of genetic disease. Meaning, finding a, a way to do genetic testing, both to carriers and also to pregnant women with children at risk of having those genetic diseases. So the idea was twofold. One, scientific, and the other one, social. And we felt very strongly that our role is really to bring about a change uh, uh, in the situation in the Bedouin community, which was, if we go, if we look at infant mortality, meaning the death of children during the first year of life, you can appreciate the huge difference between the Jewish and the Bedouin population. Uh, this is going back to 2002, but in fact, we started our project in the mid-90s. I didn't bring uh, the, the data uh, before then, but they were very similar. So to begin with, we had around 18 cases per thousand of dead children during the first year of life, while in the Jewish community, you can say the number is about five and even less than that with the years. Uh, at the end of, the, of my talk, you'll see what, is, what caused actually the decrease over the years, a very dramatic decrease, but, since, but still, in 2012, still there is a huge gap, almost threefold. And the reason for that is that when you look at the Bedouins and the causes for infant death due, uh, within the Bedouin community, you can appreciate the fact that about 49% percent of the causes for infant death are due to birth defects and genetic disease, while it is only 23 percent in the Jewish population. The Jewish population, most of the cases 
causing uh, um, infant death is prematurity. This is not the case with the Bedouins. Most, about 50% of them. So just imagine lowering this percentage will almost bring their um, uh, the numbers to, the, to what we see in the Jewish community. By the way, they are very high, they are relatively high to the Jewish community, but in terms of the, uh, uh, of the neighborhood, I mean, numbers that you see or percentages that you see in the, in the uh, um, uh, Middle East in general, they are still very, very low. In other countries, they are much higher. So, in parallel to the bench work that we are doing for many, many years, bench work meaning using all technologies to look into the molecular, the genetic basis of those diseases and looking for gene. And we started with very, what, what is perceived today, very basic, very uh, old fashioned, very quote unquote primitive methods, uh, linkage analysis, which was highly prevalent uh, in the early 90s, now nobody is doing this, or almost nobody is doing those, those kind of things. The uh, technologies nowadays are very advanced, very robust, very high throughput. You can, you can do it in, in, in a very short time on very large, um, uh, large samples. Uh, what took us a year at the time, you know, to realize, to, first, to, to find the first location, the first gene, takes now 24 or 48 hours uh, so we have witnessed this kind of progression and uh, um, throughout the years, uh, I don't feel that old, but still, you know, I feel like I, I, I managed to be in three different centuries in one lifetime in that regard. So at first we were using linkage analysis, which didn't really point out the gene itself, but the location of the gene. But when we did it in a certain family, when we found in a certain family that location, we could readily, readily um, uh, 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 it was readily available for them to use it as a mean for prenatal diagnosis and carrier detection as well. So even then, even then before we had a very precise mutation, which means if you have the mutation and if the infant has the double mutation, there is a 100% that he will be affected. Even then, we could say, but not in a, in a, in a, in a uh, definite um, uh, reliability, that the reliability of the test was about 98, 97%, and I'll go back to, the, to that in a moment. So the idea was, in parallel to that benchmark biological um, uh, uh, research, to develop a community-based program to reduce the rate of birth defects and hereditary diseases in the negative population. Uh, at first, it was uh, a program by us, the medical school. I was leading this program together with the, uh, uh, with the Department of Epidemiology and the Department of Sociology and Anthropo Anthropology in the university. Later on, in the mid-90s, but in, in the beginning of 2000, the Ministry of Education has undertaken that, seeing that we were very successful uh, undertaken this kind uh, of disease and also adopted some other recommendations that we had and I'm going to tell you uh, about them in a moment. So what were the objectives? They were to increase knowledge and understanding of the detrimental effect of consanguinity. We didn't want to go, you know, uh, directly attack consanguinity. We had very bad experience with doing it in the Bedouin community, in other communities as well, but especially in the Bedouin community. Years before, uh, we were still very young and very naive. We had this uh, tribe with maple syrup urine disease. It's a metabolic disease that actually kills babies during the first uh, month of their uh, life. And we were going back to the, uh, to the tribe and we were literally educating them on the ill effect of consanguinity and we said, and we preached you know, we said you have to stop it. You have to stop marrying within the family. So what happened was that the, that the men, the males, went out of the family, looked for wives out of the family, and the, uh, the women uh, were first of all um, uh, uh, remained. I mean, they didn't have enough cousins to marry, so they ended up being second and third wives. 
And this caused a very, very uh, big issue in the family. We, were, we felt very bad because in a way we were undermining the very basic, um, uh, 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 you know, very delicate fabric, at least the one that, that, that was, was uh, somehow um, uh, present throughout the years, especially between the young and the, and the old generation. Um, and we've decided this was not the right way to go about it. But still, we thought that we need to educate the, the public as well as the young uh, generation about the issues involved with consanguinity and, of course, how to deal with it. So to promote the use of prenatal testing and early on, because we realized very quickly that uh, termination of pregnancy, even for a very uh, detrimental disease, for a very devastating disease, is, is not an option. Unless, and this is what we realized, you know, by really working very closely with the community, that if we manage to do it before the 120th day of gestation, then there is an option for pregnancy termination of a very severely affected fetus because according to some, not all uh, religious leaders, but according to some of them, the soul enters the body at around 120 days of gestation and up till then uh, the fetus is not regarded a human being and actually if the disease is, is bad enough, you can consider uh, pregnancy termination which meant that we had to really design for some kind of a very early prenatal diagnosis. As you know, amniocentesis doesn't go before the uh, 16th week, you know, four months, so we had to plan it early on by, uh, by chorionic venous, venous uh, CVS, chorionic venous biopsy, or even earlier uh, with uh, prenatal, um, um, uh, with pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. Uh, another objective was to, to do carrier uh, screening. Again, car healthy carriers. So to allow for the matchmaking process to incorporate genetic um, information. I didn't mean, I didn't, uh, I didn't uh, mention, but I, I should have mentioned that many of those consanguinous marriages are being prearranged. So they are being prearranged between brothers, mostly brothers, at a very young age. And at a certain age, you know, they have to implement this agreement and uh, the, the couple marry. So what we have offered them is to give them the genetic information about the carrier status in order for, for them to be able to do a, a, a more calculated kind of a matchmaking. If you matchmake between either non-carriers or where only one carrier, you actually uh, uh, circumvent the, um, uh, the, the, uh, um, uh, the risk of having an affected child. Only if two parents are carriers, then uh, this is the case. So use the genetic information in order to modify your decision about arranging those uh, uh, marriages. And then, of course, uh, as I said, uh, carrier um, screening for, um, to allow early uh, prenatal uh, testing within families at risk, meaning you know, to change the whole habit of using prenatal uh, services in general. You know, using prenatal services among the Bedouin are not the same way we see in the Jewish population. They tend to come very late. To, the, uh, to have all those checkups and you know, by the time they get there, they're already seven or eight months pregnant and there is nothing you can do. So the whole idea was to educate and, and change um, uh, attitudes towards, uh, towards uh, genetic diagnosis. I'll, I'll go very fast through the um, audiences that we had uh, or the public that we, uh, um, uh, that we um, uh, approached. So within the years, we managed to accumulate genetic tests for over 30 diseases. And this is something extremely, extremely unusual. There are very small, very few communities where you have so much genetic information on the community. Even in the Ashkenazi Jews community, you have like 
15 or 16 kinds of diseases that you can, uh, you can uh, diagnose. Here in the Bedouin community, we found nowadays it is closing to 40 uh, new mutations, not only new, some of them known diseases, but new mutations in the community, uh, in, in, in those tribes. And for all of them, we can provide the genetic test. And it is, can be provided only in our lab, because other labs obviously not, are not um, uh, dealing with this kind of disease. Since 2002, those tests became free of charge. They are being covered by the government. And again, it was, uh, we were very instrumental in pushing forward the idea that in communities where, where, where there is a certain um, higher percentage than normal of certain disease, you should offer this kind of free tests, uh, which eventually will reduce costs of hospitalization, uh, long hospitalizations, very complex kind of treatment for children that nowadays, even, even though they have really very serious genetic disease, can survive because of all the modern kind of care that we can provide them. We have uh, produced a lot of, uh, of reading materials in Arabic discussing the diseases in their own terms, own ways. Uh, we have tar targeted, um, uh, we have made referrals much more easier to the, uh, to the uh, community. Women in this community do not go freely. They need to be escorted by the, their husbands or by their spouses. And some of them, you know, are not readily available. So we provided them with those services on the premises in, in their communities. And I'm not going to talk about the last thing, which is a bit more uh, time consuming. Uh, some pictures just to show you. Uh, we made it very clear that we want to use uh, people from their own community. The best people to communicate this kind of uh, ideas and information, the best ones are from the community. Obviously, um, this is not a very, um, very highly educated community, but we managed to bring young people, mostly women, um, high school graduates that we trained in the very uh, I would say, um, uh, contain way. I mean, they, they, they are not experts in genetic in general, but at least to convey certain ideas and certain um, uh, messages that we wanted to convey. And, uh, this is one example of a young woman do it in, in the mother and child health clinic. Uh, see the women sitting there. I mean, this is the, uh, the meeting place where they come for, uh, for immunizations with the kid, where they come from, from, for their prenatal care. Uh, and, and obviously, it, it has become some kind of a, of a social gathering as, as well. And in all those opportunities, uh, we had women educating them in various uh, uh, fashions on various genetic uh, issues. Now, we targeted also high school students, thinking that this is the future uh, of this community. Uh, we produced a Duke of Drama, a very nice film that that students, young people can relate to it in, in a very uh, uh, empathic way about uh, consanguinity. Uh, we have created a new curriculum in human genetics at school, uh, lectures, workshops about those various topics, the cousin marriage, uh, the, the advantages, because there are some advantages to, to cousin marriage as well, uh, but the, uh, the, um, um, the ill effect or the, the potential ill effect of them um, all, all kind of um, uh, issues, all, all kind of um, uh, facts about um, um, carrier screening, about prenatal diag diagnosis, uh, using folic acid, etc. Uh, we also addressed re the, the religious political leader because we thought um, or realized that those leaders um, have much influence on the community not on the whole community, but at least in, very, in, in their own tribes, own families. So we have designed courses in, in genetics to religious leaders. Obviously, this was very, very challenging, but we managed to do that. Um, leaders of the community now participate in our steering group, uh, steering committee uh, for the project. And since three or four years ago, we have a leading um, uh, region, a, a, a religion figure uh, joining the project staff, and he's uh, much, he's very instrumental in really conveying the ideas 
uh, to the public. Uh, uh, okay, we are targeting men, older women, community events of all kinds, uh, training community activists, all around the genetic um, uh, um, messages, and also educating the Jewish uh, healthcare and social services professionals. Many of them are still Jewish. We have more and more Bedouin professionals, nurses, physicians, social workers, psychologists, more and more, but the vast majority are still um, uh, Jewish, and we have embarked on educating them vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, you know, the, 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 both the religion, tradition, all kind of myths and conceptions um, uh, within this community. Now, what were and are still the major challenges coping uh, uh, with doing both research and community interventions in, the, in this very specific um, uh, community. Now, I have chosen, you know, some very uh, clear kind of issues that I think uh, you are, uh, you should be uh, able to relate to because they are, uh, they are coming from our Western um, culture, Western uh, um, uh, society kind of issues. Uh, that are very, very strange and not understandable to these kind of communities. First of all, the informed consent, something which is so natural to us. There is nothing that we do nowadays, and, 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 and we don't do it for many, many years, without having informed consent, meaning that you have to inform the patient either before he participates in, in a study or get any kind of treatment, or, or procedure, whatever. So, informed is something very tricky there. I mean, you have to inform, but you also have to guide, to say, you know, it's not that only, I, not only that I give you information, I'm expected to give you an advice, what to do. And to tell them, you know, it, it is entirely to you, entirely to your wife, and to you as a couple or to you as a family to make the decision after you have been provided with all the information, this is something that they don't really comprehend. And we had to really find a way how, on one hand, not to be directive, because you shouldn't be directive, and on the other hand, you know, provide them what they uh, really expected us uh, to uh, provide them with. So. Another thing that, that re was related to informed consent uh, was the idea of autonomy, for example. You know, I, we would go to a family and uh, either ask for blood samples, for example, to write an informed consent, or, you know, after having an education se session, uh, give them an informed consent that they would like to participate in these kind of activities. And then would, uh, would come the father of the household who said, um, okay, I agree. I agree, not only for myself, but for everybody, all my, ki my kids, you know, my, my, my wives, etc. At first, we used to sit there for hours explaining what is autonomy. You know, everyone is entitled to her own rights or his own right to decide about his or own self. Uh, it was useless. It was useless. Um, then, many of the uh, of participants are a little illiterate. So one thing was consent verbally. The other thing was to sign. I mean, the idea of having to sign on something that you heard, you, didn't, you couldn't read, but actually somebody else read it to you, and that somebody else is not really your, from your own community, something, somebody from the Jewish community, and not going to open this stuff because this is another very sensitive uh, 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 issue here, uh, was totally unacceptable. So the household was ready to sign up for everybody, or not for nobody, or not for anybody, or not for, or not at all, and we ended up by losing a lot of information uh, on people that uh, we couldn't get informed consent and we couldn't really get, uh, um, uh, you know, the, the, the real um, uh, approval 
by the participants. Uh, confidentiality goes together. Because for this community, I mean, knowing what is the genetic status of my brother's son, something very natural. Why should I do? I know what's my son's genetic status, whether he's a carrier mutation. I know, I want to know what is the, st the carrier stat status of my brother's daughter. So to be able to decide whether I want to match them or not. And the idea that this kind of information is going to be either her father, if she's a minor, or herself, if she's already uh, an adult, was very, very difficult to understand. And you should, can imagine yourself, you know, us sitting hours and hours with uh, people in the community trying to explain them, and I would say with not much of a success. Test reliability at first, when we only had those linkage analysis, was nightmare, was nightmare. You know, for couples who understood that their a priori risk was 25% to have an affected child, to be told that now there are there are the chance is only 2% because the test reliability is 98%, but there is still 2% risk, I mean, it was such a relief, you know, going down from 25 to 2 was a big deal for them. But for us, 2% was really not highly reliable, or the test was not highly reliable. So again, another something very, very uh, challenging was the idea and conception of carrier versus disease state. The idea that a carrier is, is something, somebody healthy that can transmit the gene, transmit the mutation, but in himself or herself uh, are healthy is very, very um, difficult, especially in this kind of a community where the women are the lowest on the social ladder, even lower than children, the lowest. So automatically, um, uh, they were always blamed. So a carrier woman in that community um, uh, has a huge um, stigmatization on her. She's highly stigmatized and has a tough time finding um, a mate, although she's perfectly normal, perfectly healthy, and with a, with a non-carrier spouse would have normal children. And the whole gamut of mis prejudices and, mis uh, and misconceptions. For example, you know, the, the term in Arabic for amniocentesis says it is mayat aras, the water in the head of the, of, the, of the child. This is the term for amniocentesis. That implies that you have to get into the head of the child in order to, to take out the water. And you know, they couldn't care about our explanation. It took us years to really take out this term from the, the, the discourse and talk about uh, amniocentesis in the right way. Myths and misconceptions. You know, there is no term for, for gene in the Arabic language. But it sounds very much like jinn. Jinn is, is a spiritual uh, creature, you know, between a demon and a genie. So, you know, within the whole concept of genetic diseases, pregnancy termination, you know, all kinds of very risky tests, you know, the idea that there are some demons over there, uh, and obviously uh, a great deal of suspicion about and this was another thing that was going on within the community about a whole plan of the Israeli government to reduce birth rate by way of, you know, uh, eugenic kind of, uh, of a mission, which was obviously total um, uh, nonsense. Um, at the end of the day, we were, I think, very, very successful in conveying data and information. We had a lot of evaluation, uh, study evaluation, and the cognitive perception of people, they, they, the way they were educated about genetics really made a big deal and a big change, both among students and among professionals. They could understand 
the, uh, the facts, they could understand the idea, they could explain you uh, the, the, the science behind it. But once it came to, to the practices to actually decide or actually agree to go through a parental diagnosis, this was entirely different. It means that decisions about prenatal diagnosis in general and about pregnancy termination in particular, because unfortunately this is what we could uh, offer them right now, there and then, uh, we realized that the factors are in, in such a traditional community are not the ones that we would necessarily anticipate. Well, obviously, level of education really um, uh, um, um, was a very much kind of, a, of a, uh, uh, was a factor that really determined. The more educated the couple were, um, and obviously both of them, uh, the more they were compliant with our uh, counseling, with our suggestions, and uh, with, with early prenatal diagnosis. Um, gender, women, we're more open to that than men. Obviously, women are the ones that take care of the children, that are involved with the burden of having uh, an affected child. Um, the strength of religious belief also correlated with, uh, with the results. The more religious they were, the less open they were to prenatal and abortion. But the, most, the two most uh, important factors were the ones in red the severity of the familial disease, and the number of unsuccessful families. So obviously, the, the, uh, the, the more affected, the more complicated was the disease. Um, the, more, the, the, the longer the survival of the affected person was, and the, the bigger the burden was, um, the more open they were for minatal diagnosis and wanted to prevent it but also the number of unsuccessful pregnancies. Because children in general, and male children in particular in this community, is something extremely, extremely important. One woman paid it, you know, better having sick children than not having children at all. Women are perceived as, you know, the world is perceived as having children. This is the mere existence, this is why they are there. And women without children are being treated, uh, I would say, as, as, as a very lower, um, uh, or, or as extremely underachievers. And of course, they face the risk of their husbands taking third or, or, or second or third wife. And what is very, very uh, cynic in that is that usually the second or third wives are not blood relatives. They are women from out of the clan, out of the tribe. Their chances of being carriers of the same gene of the family is very low. So they are having um, uh, healthy children, just to prove that they, the blame was on that woman rather than on the union. So we had really to cope with all these kinds of ideas and, 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 and thoughts and, um, and as much as possible to protect the women over there. Um, and uh, actually from that kind of, uh, of experience that I had emerged my, my strong belief that one of the major goals should be increase the education of women in that community. So thereafter, it wasn't consequential, but it was uh, a, bit, a bit earlier, we have um, founded the first um, organization to promote education uh, within Bedouin women in the community, and, and moreover, uh, higher education among those women uh, in order for them to actually take a more central role in their community in, in promoting and, and, uh, 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 this kind of knowledge and this kind of, um, of uh, participation, but also in order to uh, promote their own status. And what we are very glad 
to, uh, to tell everybody that we were at least partly successful. So uh, if you go back to this graph, you see that between 2002, in, in, a, in, a, in a decade, we managed to bring down the infant mortality in the Bedouin community, uh, I would say significantly. Not enough, there is a lot to do still, because uh, we are talking about no, very small numbers. I mean, the, uh, the percentage look high, but the numbers are small. And now we are actually monitoring each and every case. So each and every case when we have a child born with a congenital defects or, um, uh, or genetic disease, we go back to the family and we look what was going on throughout the pregnancy. Were they getting the, uh, the right uh, counseling? Were they getting the right um, uh, services? Uh, but obviously something significant happened there and the, the reason was in fact that we managed to bring down the uh, congenital anomalies and genetic disease, uh, I think in a, in a significant way, not again the way we want to do it, uh, we want it to appear, uh, but, um, um, but still, I can tell you that in, in four years we have managed to bring it a little bit down. It is now less than four, um, and the aim is, of course, to bring them to the uh, ratio that we see in the Jewish population. So it is a kind of a happy end, but we're not almost we're not there already, and uh, we are still very active with this extremely comprehensive community-based program project uh, in the Bedouin community. Thank you very much. A very short period for right. questions, but it's uh, Diane. Yeah, I mean, you've talked somewhat about the, the ethics of abortion in general, but you haven't really talked about the ethics of abortion specifically for genetic reasons. Can you talk about that? Yeah. Well, that's a very general issue. This is a very general issue. In, uh, and uh, uh, interestingly in uh, enough, uh, the Jewish faith is, uh, in fact, very open, very open to the possibility that um, uh, a pregnancy with a severely affected fetus um, uh, uh, is, is, is a burden on the mother. The mother is the center of, of, of our concerns. Uh, and, and if she wishes for an abortion, it is fairly easy in Israel to get uh, a pregnancy termination. Uh, obviously, this is not the case in the Orthodox community, and this is not the case in the Arab community. So we do cater to two communities in Israel that such an option is not on the table at all. And there is an, another program in the Orthodox community called Dorin Sharim, a very effective program that actually uh, uh, managed to bring down the Ashkenazi disease in, the, in this community to almost zero. Uh, but, uh, you know, I could, I could talk about it for an hour now, um, but this is, I think, in essence, what I can say. <coughs> oh, I'm sorry. Now that you know the molecular basis of Kami syndrome and perhaps others as well, have you had an opportunity to look at the known carriers to see whether that gene in single state is affecting the, the occurrence of diabetes and uh, obesity in the population? It's a very, very important question. And this is actually one of my huge disappointments. Because although, for example, in the Bothered Business Syndrome, uh, we, we were the ones, the first one to start studying this very rare syndrome, and now there, there are a huge plethora of studies on, on that syndrome. Um, Yet, almost none of the pathways that have been um, uh, identified till now, and there are a lot of pathways because there are now like 16 genes involved in that syndrome, 16 different genes. None of them are very prominent in diabetes, for example, or even in obesity. They have some, you know, something to do with, with the, uh, with, with the uh, I would say, um, uh, population of genes that involve with all these things, but they are not major. This is one very... Uh, however, we do have one, uh, um, uh, one disease, uh, growth hormone deficiency in a Bedouin tribe, where we identified the, the uh, mutation in uh, short sexual people. 
very interesting. First of all, we, uh, we thought about it because we uh, observed many short people in that tribe that were not as short as affected, but short in, shorter than average. And then when we check the mutation in a general population, we show that it is more prevalent in low stature uh, uh, individuals, low stature of unknown, of unknown origin, uh, definitely. So this is the only place where I, 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 you know, I found a muta genetic mutation involved in a common, much common uh, trait. Last question. Uh, so I was just wondering whether the success of your initiative has, is uh, different between types of Bedouin communities. So between the community that's settled in Beersheba, between the community that's in illegal, illegal settlements and communities that still practice a nomadic lifestyle, and whether that has also affected uh, how the Department of Education has taken on the initiative. So obviously we have started in the largest city of the Bedouin community, the Rahat, because there, you know, it, the, the, the services are much well organized uh, in the, uh, in, in, the uh, uh, in the distant, in, uh, in the non-recognized settlements, there are almost no uh, health services, or not something which is well organized. Uh, but in terms of, of genetic diseases, there is no difference. Very interesting. No difference whatsoever. There are maybe one or two tribes that don't have any genetic disease and, in fact, has a very high um, uh, um, education rate, meaning maybe it has to do with a more a higher intelligence, whatever. We never touch that. But for all others, genetic disease is being scattered as, you know, in the non-recognized as well as the recognized places, no changes whatsoever. We started our project in that community, but now the project is all over the place. So it includes also the other neighborhoods, the other um, uh, former neighborhoods, but also the non-former um, uh, non ones. Okay, I think we're going to have an onslaught of a class very soon. So let me just note yeah. to thank you uh, so much for uh, this rich uh, and interesting set of reflections on your work. You've given us a lot to think about and to take away uh, and to reflect further um, on. Before uh, we break, I want to remind people of our next seminar coming up on November 1st, which is Kim Pate. The title of her talk will be Prisons, uh, the New Asylums. So I hope that you will come back uh, to that, uh, that lecture. But for now, thanks once again to Professor Thank you.